Welcome, everybody. So I'm one of the organisers of the event. Um, I'm Dr. Freya Gary from the Met Office. Um, and I was just going to, before I pass over to the chair of the event today, explain um, that we've actually asked um, a man to chair this session because we do believe in gender balance on all of our events. Um, and it's also really important to have male allyship when we're talking about gender equality. That's really important, and, and, and specifically when we're talking here about um, women in senior leadership as well, it's absolutely vital. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Professor Albert Kleintank from the Met Office Hadley Centre to uh, introduce the rest of the session. Thank you very much, Freya. And I'm not sure one man will do, but we'll discuss that later. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. So today at COP, today is uh, the UK presidency has the themes um, gender and science. And this session actually combines the two. So we will really look at uh, and discuss um, gender equality and diversity in science and the benefits this brings. So my name is Albert Kleinting. I'm director of the Met Office Hadley Center. And it is really a pleasure to be able to chair this meeting. Um, I must admit that I was thinking when walking up here, is this the right thing to do? But then I was in two more all-male panels earlier in the week, and I really thought this is the right thing to do. So I'm really glad that I chaired this meeting. Um, we have work to do, because I just looked at the Carbon Brief uh, uh, site, and they reported that overall at COP, there is 65% male and only 35% female. So that, that, is, that means work to do. Um, but I'm very glad and pleased that we have a panel with distinguished senior leaders from the organizations who actually sponsor this science pavilion. So let me introduce the panel to you. First of all, on the left of me is Co Barrett. She's the vice chair of IPCC and senior climate advisor at NOAA. And then next to her is Dr. Elena Manengova, deputy secretary general in the WMO. And on, on the other side, on, in the back, Agostina Lobianco, I hope that's right, <laughs> Director of Development at Philanthropia Cortes Solari. And I understood um, earlier in the week that's the parent of the fun, Fondation Mairie. Great. And then next to Agostina is Professor Penny Andersby, and she's the Chief Executive of the Met Office in the UK. Okay, so the panel will discuss the benefits of a diverse scientific workforce, and they will particularly also focus on women in senior roles. And hopefully they will also share some examples how they make their organization more inclusive and how they create an inclusive environment. And that's all in five minutes each, I'm afraid. So then hopefully we will also going to hear from all of you, at least in particular the ones on the front uh, few rows. Um, I hope that you will be able to share with us what inspired you in your research career and also say a little bit about your background. And as rewarding for that, as a reward, you can ask a question to one of the panelists. So overall, that will bring us an hour into the meeting and then we will have the last 30 minutes, I hope, will be left for a more informal chat between the panelists and the audience. Okay, without further ado, I would like to start with the panel introductions and the panel um, contributions, and let's start on my left immediately with Co Barrett. Please, Co. How's that? Good sound. Uh, well, first let me say thank you for everyone to be here. It's nice to see a packed, a safely packed room. Um, and um, I love the way that you framed the session about diversity. Because sometimes it's easy to talk about gender or gender in science in terms of quotas or things of that nature. But the research is really clear. If you are looking at teams to solve complex problems, you need diversity. You need a number of different people sitting around the table helping to check each other's unconscious biases, right? You don't want the same people from the same university, from the same discipline in the same university sitting at the table because you're gonna get the same kind of thinking. 
But what you really want, and we've discovered this in the IPCC, where we have the benefit of having so many developing country scientists and indigenous voices, although not enough, um, and women, although not enough, um, that that's the way you come to solutions. I mean, as I've kind of um, risen up the ranks at my home institution, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I, I know more than ever that I need people around me who will say, ah, Co, ah, I don't know, I think you're missing this. Um, and you have to create a safe space so that people can say those things and help contribute to the conversation because um, the further you advance in your career, I think, the more you should be a servant leader and you should really listen to, surround yourself with people who can give you wise counsel. So, um, so that's kind of my core message. Like, let's build diverse teams. Um, a part of your question also, Albert, was, um, so how do we do that in our organizations? Well, in IPCC, we, um, we have created a gender action team, so we're really focused on gender equality, making our meetings um, more accessible for women, some of whom have childcare responsibilities or elder care responsibilities. And honestly, in that regard, the virtual environment has been helpful. We have had stronger participation because people haven't had to leave their families. Our last working group one approval session we had 75% more developing country representatives. Usually we pay for one or two representatives from a country to attend. Virtually, we had more diversity, and it made a difference. So um, in IPCC, we've, we've got a real focus on doing that. And in NOAA, where I work in the US, but also, I guess, in IPCC, the biggest thing we do is we model that it's possible. <laughs> I mean, you need to see people like you in leadership positions so that you can say, ah, it's possible. And then we need to mentor. And um, I bet every one of us on this stage will tell you about the hundreds of people that we um, mentor because um, it's really important. It's important for people to ask the questions. Often as women, we hold ourselves back, like we are our own harshest critics. I can't possibly step forward to do that. You know, what are the costs, X, Y, and Z? But um, often it is, it is possible to find a way to do it, and it's actually really important that people step forward to do that. So um, I think I'll, I'll kind of end it there with my comments. Thanks. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Cole Barrett, Vice Chair of the IPCC and Senior Climate Advisor at NOAA. And then we move on to the next panelist, Dr. Elena Manenkova, Deputy Secretary, Secretary General of the WMO. Th thanks very much. And I'm the first, I'm first Deputy Secretary General. I was first Assistant Secretary General. And 20 years ago, I was first Science Director of WMO and first Director of WMO, definitely. So I, I always consider myself a guy because I was working in math and physics and I was doing modeling and satellite management and, and it was kind of good for me. But when I came to my organization and in the United Nations with the gender agenda, you know, Beijing program of action on the important gender, we started looking, okay, how it, how it is we can contribute as WMO. We are a universal agency. We work with tens of thousands of meteorologists and research institutions in the world how it is we can contribute. And we said, okay, we need to look at the gender sensitive weather and climate services. That is our job, right? And that was very well received here at Co-op and everywhere else. So, but then in order to do this right, we have to also have a diverse space in our own institution. So we cannot just, just do one without another. But for us, the main, main notion, the main reason was the main ob objectives was was to find a way to find the differences and gender differences in weather climate service and disaster risk reduction and water access etc so that we can we can serve better right so we then we look at our institutions and we started making targeted actions we adopted policy on gender equality 2015 very good then we had we started doing a num number of our, uh, targeted investments in bringing more women into our circles because 30 uh, percent ceiling was like something was like a, a, not even glass ceiling it was a rock ceiling right 
we started looking where, where can we influence or where, where can we enable, empower women to teach them and to bring them into our expert groups so then they would, they would become more in, in the network, more comfort, confident and grow. And we started doing the targeted workshops on women leadership. And you know what? We have increased by 20% participation of women in those technical commissions where we had the workshop right away. And where we didn't, it was 1% to 2% because we were talking about gender equality, gender equality. So talking enough is not helpful. Targeted action, targeted action. Secondly, the meteorology is an extremely exciting job. You know, I think everyone now considers meteorologists. You know, 7 billion meteorologists we have, right? Everyone knows about the weather, and now everyone knows about the climate. But behind this, this is very high-tech STEM, STEM science. So they, it's still in many countries, the perceptions of what's girls', girls job and what's boys' job is not that. So when we go into capacity building, in education training, and even in service side, we, have, we see more women interested in raising and, 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 and bringing uh, to the leadership level. And when it is to do with this purely technical issues on infrastructure or uh, uh, the remote sensing, there is more men. So this we have to, we have to kill. And that is all to do with the schools, with the higher education, about in the families and all that. So we cannot be all in all these families, but we can promote our field of, uh, of knowledge as, as equally needed <laughs> for women and men, but also for young and for for old, we're all talking about diversity. Then we have included gender equality and diversity as a core value of WMO. This is in, in the strategic plan. One of the core values is diversity and gender equality. Right, also, also good. Then we had an action plan in Congress 2019, very specific, what to do to find all these young women out there in the country so they are coming to work with us and becoming, raising, growing to be leaders. So, and very last, uh, one thing I, I, I must mention, really, because, um, because I want to give a huge credit to, to Professor Andersby, uh, lack of recognition. Only 3% of women are Nobel Prize winners in science, ever. And WMO has International Meteorological Organization Prize. It's our Nobel Prize. Only three women for the last 70 years were awarded. Only three. Do we not have good women scientists? Yes, we do. I have been inspired by the ladies who have been doing enormous, incredible jobs, really. One of the women, I'm not even talking to Professor Andersby because she, she is right now on the lead. She is permanent representative of UK in WMO, so she is like everywhere, very, very vocal, very powerful, very inspiring. But, but there, will, there are other women as well who are bringing, for instance, free and unrestricted data policy to conclusive approval. That is not an easy job. You really need an inspiration, so women can do that. So these this, this three women were not good. So Professor Andersby last year, she, she, she came to chair this panel and she said, no, it's not possible, it's not possible. We have changed the rules of engagement, the, the criteria, how we select, how we nominate, how we this, how we that. We need to find younger people, more women. So finally, my last 10 seconds. Uh, something which helped a lot in this in this breakthrough. It's WMO reform. So last Congress 2019, WMO has made a major consistent body reform. We have changed all our commissions, all our bodies we are working, and there we included this as absolutely necessary requirement, diversity, gender, geographic, ex and uh, expertise knowledge. Gender, geographic expertise, gender, regional expertise. And all the groups we were forming, we were, we were looking where are women, where are men, where are hydrologists, meteorologists, sociologists, and other, other disciplines. And you know what? In services commission, 42% in the leadership. There is always one woman, a vice president somewhere, yeah? So this is, this, is, this is happening, but we need girls to understand that meteorology and climatology climate science, that is the job you want. Come to this job and be with us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elena. Um, so definitely this will trigger questions, I'm aware of that, but please hold these until we have finished the, uh, completed the panel and then we will come back to the questions. Um, talking about geographic, one of the uh, equalities you mentioned, we will move to the Southern Hemisphere now, to Chile, um, to Agostina Lobianco, and she's the director of the um, development at Philanthropia Cortes Solari. Um, Augustina, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. 
And as you mentioned, I'm a sociologist, so I think I'm going to give my approach from this point of view. Um, I want to highlight the evolution of the concept that we have been using when we address to gender. I remember at COP25, we were mentioning uh, the inclusion of women. But now we are talking about women leading this conversation. Uh, that's a huge shift in the paradigm, a huge shift in the way we consider ourselves and we are um, interested in participating, right? It's not that we are asking for permission to be here. It's like we are here and we are leading this conversation. That's a total different approach on one hand. On the other hand, we know we are facing the fourth revolution, science technology revolution. And in this new space, we need to consider women as the main actor. Otherwise, not considering women in this process would leave us out of the workspace of the future. So it's out of our independence, out our, of our, without economic independence, okay? So these practices, what in the end need to ensure is democracy. It's equal uh, participation. It's multidisciplinary participation. It's enlighten ourselves and each other with all the things that each genders have to do. How do we do it in Mary Foundation? Uh, in Chile, only 32% of people working in science are women. And from Mary Foundation, we have been acting tirelessly from this corner of the world, which represents less than 0.3% of the worldwide emissions to tackle climate change through different means. One of those is education. What do we do? We lead program, programs, educational programs, Involved, that involves boys and girls in the same quantity, in the same amount, totally equally. Why? Because we want them to have the same approach to science, okay? So in that case, we, uh, we need to understand that the mainstreaming of competencies is becoming increasingly important facing this fourth revolution, and we need the accessibility, we need to uh, close the gaps in terms of salary as well, in terms of career building, in terms of leadership positions. Why? Because this is going to ensure our economic independence, our democracy, and most of all, favorable consequences for the social institution. Great. Thank you very much, Augustina. Um, and then the final panelist, uh, Professor Penny Endersby from the ex Chief Executive in the Met Office. And let me use one word from Alina, and that is inspiring. And as a, as a manager, a higher manager for myself, I really find uh, Penny really very inspiring. So Penny, the floor is yours. That's extremely kind of both of you. Thank you very much. So yes, I'm a, a physicist and engineer by training, but I've spent most of my career in defense. And I actually started my career as an armorer blowing things up. And believe me, um, to, to, to you, climate science, you may think, has problems, but to me, coming into it, I really thought it was rather good on gender equality. And certainly when I started my career, I was used to being the only woman in a, in a room full of grey suits. Um, and really, there is a, a, a proud history of women working in climate science. From, from Eunice Foote in 1856, the lady who first set the uh, parameters for climate sensitivity and whose estimate is still valid for what our models think today, through to Susan Solomon with her work first on the ozone layer and then, then with the science working groups, or Christina Fergaret, um, tell me if I've said that wrong, the architect of the Paris Agreement, uh, and even among, among leaders. So the Hadley Centre itself was founded by Margaret Thatcher, no longer Britain's only female prime minister, but still, I think, the only one with a science degree. Um, and probably not a coincidence that she was able to understand quite early on the messages that the climate scientists were sharing with her and think it was, it was actually worth doing something about. So that was in 1990. And we know we, there were some lovely pictures on the, um, on the screen while we were waiting of climate scientists uh, who are active here um, and you know, many more from all our, all our institutions, busy, as you say, in the, in the negotiations, writing the working group reports and so on. And that is really, really important because we also know that all disadvantaged groups suffer disproportionately from climate change. Um, that women 
typically are disadvantaged compared with men across the globe and therefore um, more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and even more of course when that's combined with some other characteristic and we know we know from research that uh, at a national level countries with good gender equality um, also tend to have good policies on climate change so there's a proportionality there and there's an inverse proportionality to vulnerability to climate change. So um, not just for women, but for everybody. Uh, if you have poor gender equality, and I'm not saying which is cause and which is effect, you tend also to have higher vulnerability to climate change. And we've had some very interesting statistics about the percentage of women at COP, I think that was 35. The percentage of women in Chile, 32. That's the dough. In the UK, the, the, the STEM workforce is 24% female. So well done, Chile. <laughs> Um, on the UN climate panel, 20%. In the Met Office, it's 36%, so still could do better. Um, but in our science graduates now, it's over 50% female. So there, there is that, that pipeline coming and that talent that, that we can continue. And what you say, Co, about all aspects of diversity, I, I entirely echo. Um, and in fact, we've been working, probably resulting in this for some time, on gender equality in the Met Office, and we've been pursuing the UK's benchmark, which is Athena Swan for gender. We've just ditched that in favor of the benchmark for um, investors in diversity, which is all the aspects, uh, because actually our gender is not looking so bad compared with some of, say, our ethnicity characteristics, which are not so good in Exeter. Um, and when I think about what motivates women to get involved in, in scientific careers, or indeed in any career, the thing that we've, we've seen so much about the role models, the mentoring, yes, we all do mentor, but also I would like to acknowledge some of the wonderful mentorship I've experienced on my way through as well that's given me the comp confidence to apply for that next role. But I think that very often women are inspired by something where they can see a direct impact on, on people's lives of what they do and often on the lives of individuals. Um, and so it's that storytelling that's very important. And even within climate science, I still see a, a better representation of women in the applied science. We have lots coming in through the forecasting route where you can see the impact of the advice you give immediately than we do on perhaps the, the numerical modeling and some of those other aspects. And yet we all know that you, if you manipulate data, take, take the COVID pandemic, doing the piece of work that tells you actually whom you should vaccinate or in what order or, where, or whether masks are effective is at least as important as being somebody who's putting vaccines into somebody's arms. You have a much greater force multiplier effect. So I think trying to get that message out of the connection between the science and then the saved lives is, is really, really valuable. I'm just going to leave us on the more to do point. Um, this, when I walk around COP and even in this pavilion and not just today, I, I think that um, I see not too bad um, a representation. But I know that if I were over there with the people, the decision makers, it would not look, look quite the same. If I were in the green zone with the activists, it would be as much the other way. And I know there have been meetings there where they've been saying, a group, largely women in the room saying, why are we here? Why are we not there making the decisions? So there's definitely work to be done on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Penny. So let me just, before I come to the audience, let me just ask if Elena or Ko, because you probably want to respond on somewhat the others said. Yes, please go ahead, Ko. I just want to pick up on the mentoring point and make a really important point to many of you who are much younger than I am in this room. I, I, in my mentoring conversations, I learn as much from the next generation as I think I impart. And, you know, our, my generation, I won't speak for us, but our generation, our generation I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> our generation had to elbow ourselves to the table and in some ways, you know, I was a female athlete, and those skills that I learned on the court enabled me to be making my way and not allowing someone to talk over me. Um, but I, I was always concerned that I was reflecting a certain kind of woman, a woman who was inherently assertive. And um, I'm learning, especially from the next generations, that we have to fight to make space for all kinds of women women who are soft-spoken, women who may, um, you know, just come from different cultural backgrounds. And so I just wanted to say in that mentoring conversation, thank you to those of you who are willing to mentor us. 
you, you gave me opportunity. I don't remember what to answer, but just one thing I want to contribute is that in, in, in all these policies and restrictions and targets and quotas may work, but it's really not bringing us where we want to be. What works is culture. It's culture. Any institution is much more successful when they have a diverse workspace. That, that, that's shown in, in a lot of literature. So it's, it's facts which speak loudly on themselves. Okay, thank you very much. Any response from the other side? Yes? Yes, Please. from this side. Yeah, go I ahead, want to pick up something <laughs> From go this ahead. side of the ring, I want to pick up something that you just said, um, which has to do with uh, what's the question underneath. It's power and decision making in the end. Now we're talking about the scientific field, but we can talk about any other field where women are not exactly represented. So that's the question underneath. Why women are activists and not are taking decisions? So this is the gap that we need to fill. That's the question underneath, I guess. Okay, good. So let's move to the audience now. Like I said, you will have the opportunity to ask a question to one of the panelists, but please also tell us a little bit about your background and what inspired you and what made you choose for a career in science or in climate science. Uh, who wants to go first? Who can I give the floor? Yeah, don't do the girl thing. You cannot wait till the first man because I'm the only one. Can you hear me? Uh, well, my name is Carmen Otrik. I come from Mexico, uh, and I'm currently studying at the Technical University of Munich, a uh, master's in sustainable resource management. So that's how we got here. And well, I actually have a lot of questions, but I'm just gonna focus it on one of the things you just said, Co. That I think it's really important to include what you were saying about including all types of women and also how important it is now to allow like the sensitive side of women to interact in the science part and to allow like the vulnerability we have to form a part of that. And with that, I also want to ask uh, Agustina. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that what is the social impact you've seen in the communities in Chile that you have been helping with educational programs and everything. I mean, like in the social aspects, if there was a reduce in violence or if there's, yeah, like in general, the impact the community has been having. Um, from the social point of view, we know that education, it's the base of every social change that we want to achieve. On those grounds uh, is that Mary Foundation works on. And from that, you need to evolve into uh, some other generations which are coping with gender in another way. You know, my generation is, hasn't coped in the same way to in, 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 uh, get into the labor space as you did, certainly. So each generation, sorry, but it's like that. I mean, each generation has its own struggles, let's say. And the ones who, and we really need to um, make a round of applause for the next generation as well that are really activists and are going to, are coming with a lot of strength as well. And that's the one we, we, we need to focus on maybe. And they're going to be really powerful. And well, that, that's, that's basically what we need to do, yes. And socially, that makes a huge change. Okay, thank you, Augustina. Ko, you wanted to reply as well? Just yeah. really quickly. Um, so, um, you know, I think when I was speaking just a minute ago, I was talking about elbowing my way to the table. Um, uh, in some ways, I was emulating how the, how the men were working with me, right? Um, and I'm so happy we're moving beyond that. And we find women who are so open to collaboration, who are sh power sharing, right? Because the workload is too big. We have to help each other. Um, so again, I think we learn. I loved your your statement, Augustina, about how you know each generation helps us to kind of do these things better, uh, and you know, moving from adopting a male perspective in order to succeed is certainly a, mo a move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. The diversity also in generations. A really good point. 
Who else? Who's next? Yes, okay. please, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Kirsty Lewis. I'm a climate science advisor at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and I'm actually on secondment from the Met Office. Um, so, in, in terms, uh, my background is also within physics, and I'm kind of used to being in an environment with a, with a lot of men. Um, from my experience, my inspiration, I suppose, I'm very passionate about the work I do around climate adaptation and communication of climate science, and, and I've I found that, that that hasn't really been a problem for my career, but I really appreciate you here as kind of leaders in your area. And my question is related to, at my stage of my career, I've kind of worked in this area for a long time, but how do, you, how do you kind of break through to become, you know, to kind of a leadership role? When you think about women's experiences, I've realized more and more is diverging from my male colleagues as I take on more family responsibility, you know, the practicalities of, so I guess that's my question, not to anyone in particular, but anyone has experience of how do you get through the practical differences of like, the lives of women are often quite different. And I think it's great to see we have many more young women coming up. My worry is how do we get those to flow through so that we see them in leader positions as well? Alina, do you want to take this one? You mentioned all the steps that you've been through. Well, yeah, I don't have a say, structured answer and just tell you a few things. And um, yeah, when when uh, when uh, Christiana Figueres did the first high level uh, first COP event in, in one of uh, on gender, so similar question was asked from the bottom of the room by one African I think uh, woman how to get there how to be like you, and then I rem remember answered I'm no different than you, I also have two children. And I, and I studied in two universities, and I had a job, and I had a family. I had all that. And, and in my gener and our generation, in our culture, I had my own challenges. I had to make my husband happy that for what I'm doing, and he, he eventually became extremely proud that his wife has PhD in physics and math, because it's some, something it's, it's difficult for him. I had my mother and my uh, and stepmother uh, happy to take care of my children. I came late to school. I was always last mother to pick my children from the school. I remember all these things, and they, they still hurt here. But there were choices I made, not for the career, because I was passionate of my work. I loved what I was doing. I felt an excellence. I felt that what I'm doing, no one else can. I am really the best. And I spoke up. I went and I said, I can do that. I do this like this. And all of a sudden, they start noticing you and taking you up and higher and higher and higher. Just speak up. Thanks very much. <laughs> Great passion about the job. That is really important. Um, Freya, the microphone, oh yeah, over there, please. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Camina Sola, I am from Chile. I am marine biologist, have some experience working in marine mammal research and also some oceanic phenomenon issues. And here I'm representing a foundation that is called Tremendous Foundation. And we're, um, we are with a project that is called Academia Climaticas. That is a project uh, that gives education, environmental education, to over 600 girls in Latin America and the Caribbean. So, but, well, yeah, that's why I'm here. But uh, my question is, uh, in your experience, what will be your observation, uh, speaking in, in the issue of, we have to raise all kind of women, but the woman we see on science today is the woman that could like uh, face all these uh, hard conditions but we lost a lot of women in the way, women that wanted to become scientists, but they couldn't like face all these mansplaining and all these patriarchy science. So what will be your observations on, on that, on all this knowledge we lost because of the women we lost in the way that couldn't become scientists? Thank you very much. I think we lost, and it's also even more so when we come to the higher levels. Penny, can you? Yeah, yes, I would like to answer that. And also it comes back to the diversity point that, that um, Carl made earlier around many of us, you're right, we had to make our way in a very masculine environment. And I mean, I spoke about defense. I used to build armored targets in a room where there was a page three girl on the wall with bare breasts. And every morning I would color in a bikini on the girl before I built the armored targets. To be honest, I found it a little bit annoying and a little bit funny, but there were other women who would have found that such an, an, un, an unfriendly environment, they maybe, maybe were lost. Equally, not all men are there, elbows out, assertive here. Actually, 
Albert isn't somebody who elbows his way to the table. And a, a different model of leadership where there's, where there's room for where, the, where there's room for being more reflective and, and bringing different perspectives is, is part of that diversity. I'm going to say something about Elena, then, as returning the compliment, but you and I, we're both singers. I have often thought that part of my success in life is just having a very loud, clear voice and good <laughs> breath control. <laughs> it, it's instead of being an athlete, which I'm not at all, um, but we, ne we need to get past this to this model, and you know, I, I fear that those women are lost forever, but we don't want to lose the next generation of thoughtful, reflective human beings. Um, and while I'm here, it's, I celebrate the fact that there are men in the room who've taken the trouble to come along and be those allies and find out more, because they can bring that voice to their own peers and that community of what that experience is like for their female peers. And if, if we just talk to women, we know that experience, so having people to share it is really important. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Cole. Yeah, well, I just wanted to add a little bit. Um, we have lost so many voices along the way. And, you know, I think one of the things that's really fabulous about this COP is that we're finally focusing on indigenous voices that have been lost for hundreds of years. Um, but I wanted to come to the point of where we lose women, especially in, in the STEM field. And there's interesting research that talks about girls in, in the middle grades Right? So when they hit the, their early teenage years, the dynamic in schools changes so that they are sometimes very focused on the, the opinions of their peers at a time where they then stop asking questions, pulling back, maybe losing confidence to step forward in, in the classroom. And I think it's really important that we focus on those girls and make sure that we bring them through that time. Because they're fearless before that, you know, and, and we can't afford to le lose them then. We really have to f work on bolstering them and helping to kind of counterbalance the, um, sometimes the peer, the culture of their peers that sometimes starts to hold them back and stops them from asking curiosity questions that may seem foolish as they stand up in their classrooms. Thanks. Who's next? You don't need to be a singer or an athlete. Who's next? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My name is Elena Egidio. I'm a geologist and I'm a PhD student in hydrogeology. And during my career, I'm Italian and a lot of people say that geology is only for men. And even if I'm 25 years old, still some someone continue to ask to me why I'm a geologist, even if I am a woman, and why I put some dress and skirts, even if I am a geologist. <laughs> and I just want to ask, as I told you, I'm a PhD student, and I don't know around the world, but for example, in this moment, if I want to get pregnant, it's impossible since they don't give me anything for five months, just stop the PhD. So I think that this is something that we have to talk about it. I'm daughter of a researcher, so I'm used to have a mother that love her works in science. But I, I always try to ask what, what, how to balance the, what, the need of family and the need of work and do something that we all want to do. I'm really passionate about what I do. So I think that is a good point. It's also because Italy is known as a developed country. I don't know what happened around the world. And this is, could be interesting. Great, yeah, definitely, go ahead. Uh, because um, that's very interesting what you mentioned because it has to do with how slow social structures change. We might be fighting for some rights, women's rights are human rights, so we might be fighting for that, but until society and culture changes and actually adopts some political policies such as women pregnant should blah, 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 whatever the, the right is, that takes a lot of time. And in that time, we get not only exhausted, but a rage comes from underneath that says, we need, I can't stop fighting on this because it's my right. So but actually happens. And I see that happen, and I see a really important shift, as I mentioned before, from COP25, 
no one was here. Remember COP25 when we had the conversation? It was all full of women and not a man. So men are really welcome here. Thank you for being here. Um, because this is not a matter of um, women against men. It's just working together to have a more democratic society. Thank you very much, Agustina. That makes me remind what Co said at the start, that the COVID times and we are more working from home probably also is beneficial in that respect. Is there any response from anyone else in the panel on okay. this point? Elenia, do you want? Yeah, I think comment? that I also had in my notes, I didn't say that during COVID women suffered much more. Yeah, much more. And yes, and we will have such statistics even here and there. It's really, it's really the case, not just in science, but also in the field and everywhere. It's, it's, um, but uh, something about work-life balance, I think our generation, and I will, we will keep repeating this as long as we sit together, right? <laughs> our generation, we had a little bit different, uh, different uh, environment. And it also depends on the culture. I can say that in WMO, every newborn child is celebrated by all 300 uh, employees. This is big for us, you know, yeah, we have a child. Also, because of COVID, which made a lot of troubles to all of us, but it made also something interesting. It, it broke through things which we would probably not be able to change in, in another decade. We are now teleworking like this. Right, we telework. At my time, I couldn't think, you know, being pregnant and, and, and have my dissertation, how do I do this? But this is a little different. It's, it's a genes when, when you are in love and, and you want, when you want to have a baby with your, <laughs> with your partner, the, the work is the last thing you think about this. You, you, have, you have to think of a demographic, demographic contribution <laughs> and the rest will come. The rest will come. <laughs> Let's make your priorities right. Thank you, Alina. So moving yeah. on to this side in the Good back, afternoon. please. Yes. I'm a Loretta. I'm from Nigeria. I'm a lecturer with the Federal University of Petroleum Resources in Nigeria. Um, our university is actually a science-based university. You have engineers and, and new scientists. So initially when we started, we had very few uh, women, but now we're having more women. But what I observe about the, the, the women is that some of them feel as a woman, they are kind of complacent compared to men in their class. There was a girl in electrical engineering department. She was doing very well. She was supposed to actually come out with the first class. But she said, the other girls are not struggling. She was the one just struggling. So before you know it, she got discouraged. At the end, she came out with a, a second class upper. So what I'm trying to say is that as a woman, we have our cultural differences. But where the culture allows you to excel, to actually come out with whatever potentials you have, don't be complacent. Don't think because you're a woman, you can get married, it doesn't matter. But you have a role to play in your community, in your society, in your family. So we should make sure we excel, not just being activists and fight, saying you must be recognized. You must have something to put on the table. So that by the time you speak as a woman, you are respected. So that we have Okonjo Iwela. She's a Nigerian, she's uh, one of the world, uh, world trade uh, leaders. But today she's excelling. So if you have the potential and your cultural belief allows you, don't be complacent. You have something to deliver. You'll be respected for whatever potentials you have. The world is competitive. We should have to realize that. And the world kind of encourages men. So as a woman, you just need to make the extra effort to excel and you'll be respected for it. Not by that, you have to respect me as a woman. I don't have anything to put on the table. Nobody will respect you for it. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Respected for what you bring to the table. Any, any res quick response from anyone in the panel? No? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, great. So the mic over here and then over here. Yes, go ahead. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I'm Claire Dupont. I'm a professor of climate governance at Ghent University in Belgium. Um, so my background is more social science, political science. Um, which at the time when I was doing my PhD was also particularly male, in fact still a male dominated field, but far less so than defense for sure. Um, and I just wanted to hear from your experiences of working in a university environment, because I'm very inspired by how you're talking in your institutions, 
but you all would have gone through your, your research probably in connection with universities. And I do find that it's ironic that the research that comes out of university that talks about the benefits of diversity, and at the same time, universities seem to be among the slowest institutions to change. And the culture that uh, um, Elena was talking about uh, that needs to change and the institutional setup that needs to change doesn't seem to happen in an academic environment as quickly as it seems to do in other institutions. And I'm tired, to be honest. And I just would love to know how to, how to really work towards making that cultural change in a university higher education environment where all these metrics are set that are very much built from the, the time when academia was just male. And those metrics have stayed. Why, are, why is that the way that we assess academic quality and research quality? I'm just wondering if you can have some ideas about the university environment. Thank you. Academia. Do you want to go first, Penny? Well, it's not. I, I almost wonder what you had to say, Albert, because you probably spend more time in the in the university environment than, than I do, because we've been out of it for a long time. From my role as a as a visiting professor, I mean, I, I completely agree with you about the metrics. They're very macho metrics, aren't they? So, uh, the, the citation ratings and grant the amount of grants you can win, and then some of those. And they're also metrics which lend themselves to old boys clubs. Um, because you cite the papers of the people, the researchers you already know. I was hearing a sad story of how grants were assessed for a very hotly contested telescope and how they, they had a, a very inequitable... So, so even for the low percentage of women in, in the particular applicants, they were still seeing a very low success rate. And the panel at least had enough self-knowledge to question um, and get somebody in to look at what they did, and they um, observed them making the decisions and they went, I know John, he's a good guy, his research group's always good, we'll get good research and, and gave the grant there. And as soon as they made the research blind, the percentage came, um, came up to the, the, uh, reflect the percentage of, of female applicants. So I don't know how, you know, the, what I can't really do is answer your question, which culture change comes from the top. And if it's, if it's written through the organization, it can really only come to the top. And from trying to do it from grassroots, is very tiring, um, and so it, it needs you. Know, we need those senior voices to champion it where it is. And I, I, I look to other panelists to, if they have better examples than than I've been able to give you. I think I'm mostly just agreeing with you. Um, I totally agree. And as as a colleague, you know how slow these changes uh, in institutions take. Um, but ba basically. The, if there's um, just to get down to work, I mean, no. Uh, if there's a gender uh, office or something like that inside the institution or human resources, just get there and start working with your group in order to push forward your needs. Okay, thanks. Moving okay. on, yes, please. Can everyone hear me? Oh, yep. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so I'm really nervous, but I just want to say I'm very happy to be here. Um, all of what you said really resonated with me. Um, so I'm Hazal Kara. I don't have a bachelor's or master's or PhD yet. Um, I am a high school student in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, and I'm currently applying to college in the US, hopefully going into physics and maybe environmental studies, environmental uh, science, that sort of field. Um, so I'm normally a youth activist. I'm actually here with an organization called the Global Youth Development Institute. Um, and I'm a part of Fridays for Future. Uh, so there's a podcast that um, a fellow activist has called Idealistically. Um, and the whole concept behind it is basically asking the guests what would be, like, just assume that there are no limits, what would be your ideal version of the future? Um, so I kind of wanted to bring that question to here and ask um, all of you um, if you were to imagine like an ideal workplace in terms of gender equity and gender inclusion, uh, what would that look like? Like when you inven envision it, what does it look like exactly? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Great question. Really good. Thank you also for engaging. So it's a quick, great question, but also a very difficult question. Who wants to go first? What does the ideal workplace and well, ideal I workplace look like? I don't like? have answer and I probably will not figure one at the end of the panelists, but so I will hit the road right away. So I do not have ideal picture of the workplace. I think I am an ideal workplace. 
I am, you know, whomever comes to Dublin Mall, I say, look how wonderful this climate here. We have such a wonderful relations. I am seeing the people around me because, because they are dear to me. They are doing something which I like, which I respect, which helps me. I don't care if it is men or women, big or small. I don't care of the grades. Of course, I'm administrator. Uh, with, with due respect, there are certain responsibilities which I would know who, who, should, uh, who should be accountable for. But in the workspace, if you treat the people just because they make great contribution, this small or this big, it doesn't matter. So I am an ideal space. Just in the previous question of university, I didn't answer because I'm not teaching. But, but I, I think I'm lucky kid, perhaps, because I was in Moscow University, I'm, I'm based in, in Moscow, right? Russia, of course, Moscow University is based in Moscow, where else can, can be based, right? I was in geography, and this, this, my university studies of geography were, were fantastic. It was unisex discipline. There was no boys and girls. We were all the same. We were an expedition in the middle of nowhere, in the circumpolar, in the, in the, in, in the Arctic night, and everyone was wearing the same thing. Everyone was doing the same thing. I can chop the trees. I can drive the huge cars, big boats, no problem. <laughs> so I never felt that I'm anyhow different because we were all the same. We were all doing the same thing. So that's probably, the, probably this little experience helped me to, to not to feel somehow different. I just try to feel like everyone else. Jenny? I think it was such a brilliant question. We should all have a go at it, this one. And I think the first thing I'd like to say is you said you were nervous and you obviously felt you didn't have the right to be here. And that's something, please, to overcome it because it was a question that nobody else could have asked. And um, next time, be braver because your voice is worth hearing. Um, <laughs> And it's also a hard question to answer, but I think I would like to get to the place where we don't have to worry about any of these things because we can listen to different sorts of voices and we know they'll be represented. And I'm not just talking about gender or race or sexual orientation, but thinking styles and social backgrounds and some of those other aspects of diversity as well. Some of those off-the-wall questions that have come from different people and actually particularly from the, the very young voices in the room have been outside the group think of what the rest of us were expecting to hear. Um, and they've been, so I, I happen to agree with you and not to agree with the last one, but it didn't, it didn't matter. What was different was it took us by surprise and made us think afresh, and that's the value that it brings, and that's the value that not having all the same voices in the room brings, whatever the mix. Great. Cool? Yes? Well, first I'm gonna say this. Um, true confession, folks. My terminal degree, my highest degree, is a bachelor's degree in environmental studies. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think that sets for you um, an example that there are so many pathways to lead. And, you know, I, I don't know how it was for you, Penny, but I spent many, many years apologizing for not having a PhD, despite the fact that I couldn't, I mean, I could have done a PhD, I just didn't want to dig deep into one tiny little topic. I wanted to think broadly across and connecting things. Um, so I just want to put that on the table because that needs to be said. Um, <laughs> I was, when you asked the question, I thought, wow, um, I think work-life balance is tremendously important right now and COVID has pro proven that we can do that in a different way. And how many of us are so happy that we've seen people's dogs and babies and grandparents in the Zoom frame behind them, right? It's like, it's kind of broken our barrier, like, oh, I'm at work now, I can't think about my employees or my coworkers as people. Um, so that's like a new thing, right? We wouldn't, I don't know, I guess we wouldn't have got there. But 10 years from now, you're, the answer to your question is gonna be different yet again. Right? Maybe we will have achieved work-life balance and now we want whatever. But um, I thought Penny answered your question in a fabulous way. Like, thank you for your voice. Great. Agustina, do you want to? Yes. Um, of course. Thank you for bringing your voice out. Uh, really. M make it louder. Um, and I think that it's so important to talk about these things. And if we want to go broader than gender, I would say that my ideal place to work is a place without stigma. Gender stigma, race stigma, age stigma, 
diversity, not diversity, uh, yeah, a diverse place of work. Okay, Elena wants to just, just, Yeah, just one, just follow up, yeah, but, yeah, bonus, yeah. bonus, bonus. About, about, about you being uh, embarrassed or, or uh, ner nervous to speak. You know, not very recently, and WMO runs many high-level panels, like people, very eminent people, like with the great careers or, and uh, quite recently we had one panel with a woman astronaut in there. There were three women, woman astronaut, woman minister, and woman, some don't remember, it doesn't matter. And there was an important panel, very many people. And then we had a coffee, tea, like uh, evening, social life, networking, chemistry building, right? And this woman astronaut, I, I deliberately won't tell, tell you her name. She said, you know, I wasn't originally even afraid to speak because I'm, I was not quite, quite kind of sure what I'm speaking right things. Astronaut. And, and she said, but, but when this two other women entered the room in otherwise male panel, she felt rel relieved. Okay, now I can speak. Yeah, so it's a little tricks. If you feel more comfortable speaking in the presence of other two women, bring them with you. Yes? <laughs> how, how would you feel if you would be only girl in the room with, with gentlemen in there? I, I wonder, would, would, you, would you be courageous enough to speak? Bring two girls with you and speak. Great. Look, looking at the clock, I think we can do two more. So two or maybe three, so let's Great. go ahead, let's go ahead. Thanks, uh, first I hope it's okay uh, to say something to my academic colleague over there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm Jesse O'Reilly, I'm an anthropologist at Indiana University, I'm mid-career, and just as soon as you have any power, you have to seize it and change policy, so I just am on some committees, and um, at our university we don't have like a carbon offset policy, for example, but our committee decided to be an activist committee and now leadership can't say, we don't have a uh, carbon offset policy because we can point to our little, little our, our little institute and talk about policy there. Similarly, we like force meetings to end in an hour and to be held during times where childcare is available and um, that sort of thing. So trying to change policy, as so and we did this uh, pre-tenure um, as sort of a band of, of, of female academics. Um, okay, my question to you all is, I've interviewed hundreds of climate scientists and policymakers, and most people are actively working toward uh, equality and diversity, um, even if they're doing it sort of awkwardly, they all, most of them have good intentions. What are your techniques for dealing with outliers who actively resist this, who prefer the old boys club, um, maybe some sort of informal techniques for when people dominate conversations or steering things in a, in a weird direction. And then what are some techniques from an institutional culture perspective? Thank you. Thank you very much. I suggest we take one panelist. So re dealing with resistance, who wants to give, give it a go? Go, please, yes. Um, so um, I'll say that uh, one thing we've done in the IPCC in this regard is that we've actually trained people to be inclusive. Trained um, facilitators, leaders, and the author groups to actively in go to include people in, in the conversation. And it sounds simple, but actually people need to be trained in this um, because the loud voices often carry a conversation and it takes Re the ability to kind of hold the presence and say, well, it's interesting, like maybe to invite someone, but often inviting someone is also daunting. So you, there's just a whole series of techniques to reach out to, to be inclusive. And it's just one example, but everybody can do that. Everybody can think about whose voice is silent here and how do we bring that out? Okay, please go ahead. Great. Hi, um, I'm Ethne from the Institution of Environmental Sciences. Um, I was inspired to pursue a science career as I grew up in a commune in Devon, which very much uh, fostered a love of nature for me. Um, but when I went to do my bachelor's at Imperial, it was um, a very different kind of culture. So my question is, how can we support people with intersectional identities, um, including things like race, gender, but also socioeconomic background, so that they can get over issues like imposter syndrome and feeling like they have something valuable to add? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm looking at the panelists. 
Thank you. Well, one thing that we do have very strongly in the Met Office is the staff networks uh, that represent all of these um, different communities. And they started as, again, grassroots networks that formed themselves. You saw the Women in Climate Network on the, on the screen. But I know that um, where we've encouraged them to form, people have found those very powerful. And the other thing I think is around the, the role modeling of, um, we did something in my previous organization that we did career snakes that showed for some of the people um, the routes that they'd taken and that enabled people to see, um, as you say, people with a different social background um, that, you know, we were surprised here to find that two of us only have bachelors. But on my executive, I have people who either don't have degrees or they did them much later on in their career. They came up an apprenticeship route. Um, and, and funny, apprenticeships were common in our generation. Then they fell out of favor, at least in the UK, and now they're really back in favor again. And I'm sure we will have many more people you know, come to success that way. So those are two things I offer you for that, that are a little helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. So I suggest we have one more, Freya, and then, like I said early on, we do have time later on. The panelists will be around until 4 o'clock, so please do engage and ask your questions directly, one-to-one. -one. But one more, please. Um, I, at the very start, I said I don't know whether you uh, hear this, but please in, uh, introduce and provide a little bit of your own perspective and your own career in science, potentially, and then also a question for one of the panelists. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marie-Louise Havana. Uh, I'm a forester working with the African Forest Forum uh, based in Nairobi. I just want to say, yes, this forestry is also that aspect of science uh, we, be, we believe is not for women because uh, that really in, uh, involves many trees from the field in the forest and so on. But um, I want to go in the same side with my close neighbor, uh, sister, Nigerian, saying we have, we have to show something on the table. But we have to give opportunities to these ladies, to this knowledge we are hide, hiding there to come on the table by making sure on assessing what are their barriers to contribute and how can we uh, try to address this challenge and give them the opportunity to come on board and to try and see how they can contribute. They have, we cannot do without them. And we have a lot of knowledge there. And in our institution, we try to do some gender responsive program to make sure that not only women, but youths or in the forestry sector, what, where is their, where are they contributing the most? And how can we uh, make sure we have those aspects in the program to, and to involve them? And anytime we are doing assessment, selecting SPAC, we want to see who, uh, if there is a woman, give her the opportunity also to contribute. If there is a youth, give her the opportunity and let, the, let, her, let them bring their on perspective on the table, and so that uh, at any moment we have them on board and we have them contributing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, how do we break down the barriers and bring everyone who has something to offer on the table and make their voices heard? Any response from anyone in the panel? I would say by um, training people inside the institution, same as Helen mentioned. Um, I would also say through programs, through educational programs, and through responsive gender programs as well. That would be a very good approach to bringing these voices. Okay. In, in WMO, we, are, uh, we cannot work but working with the communities of, pra of practice. It's the only way. And for instance, when we talk about climate predictions or seasonal climate outlooks, the way we do it, we bring meteorologists, hydrologists to the place, to the region, and we have several places in, in, in the globe, which is called climate outlook forums. And in these forums, it's not just welcome. We are searching for the organizations like yours, forestry, health organizations, civil protections, others, they come together and they discuss what, this, what the forecast looks like and how to react on this. As a result, 
we generate a consensus outlook for the region which is practically applicable to the user groups. So I'm, I'm sure that you just send us a mail or anyway, anybody, me, we will, we will reach you out next, next forum. We do it's an almost seasonal event and this is necessary. Also, it's very practical when, when we go directly to the farmers, it's especially works in North Africa and the east part of Africa. We go right there in the small half, half, uh, farmers and we talk to them village by village by village by village. It's called roving seminars. Thank you very much. I think I should bring this to a close now. And can I really have a very big round of applause for our panelists? Thank you, very, thank you very much. And also thanks everyone online and here in the audience. And like I said, for those in the audience, there is the opportunity to interact with the panelists.